what would happen to really change things is that you keep having demand decline, which I think you will have. And that is um, when that happens and unemployment goes higher, the demand even goes lower. And then that what happens from that is all of a sudden companies have to cut prices, margins go down. They're not making as much money. And obviously prices go down. I'm talking about public prices. So I think that's the catalyst or that's basically the way it all comes out. And it's over a, probably over the next two quarters, three quarters. That's what the way it's going to come out. And I, that, that to me would translate into a lower market and it would make sense to us. Ted Oakley is back. He is a founder of Oxbow Advisors, and we'll be talking about positioning, portfolio allocation, how to protect your wealth, and what's next for the economy and the stock markets. Ted, welcome back to the show. Always good to host you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, David. I hope you've had a good summer. The economy has certainly seems to have had a good summer. A lot of people, even on my own show, have started to switch stances from being bearish to bullish. So before we get into the economic data and some of the quotes from other economists that I'd like to bring to your attention, I'd like to ask you first, have you changed your stance? Previously, you were on my show four months ago. You were saying that there could be a possibility of a recession. Um, you've called for potentially more bankruptcies. We've seen the data to support that. A great reckoning was your word. Words. Do you still hold that view? You know, David, I do. I think uh, what people fail to realize is that it, you can look at a lot of things in the economy and try to draw the certain things, but GDP and economics and the whole business cycle runs off of demand. And when you have demand declining, which we certainly do the last three months, four months, and it's every every single month is a little worse. Uh, I'm not certain why I, I can't get the picture that people are drawing that we're not going to have some landing, but, uh, but I, certainly, I certainly see the same things that I saw four months ago. All right. So I'll just read you a few quotes from some uh, economists from banks, and maybe you can help us clarify where you may have a disagreement. So this is from uh, Nathan Sheets. He's a chief economist at Citibank. Services demand continued largely unabated. The labor market has stayed strong. Wages have continued to rise. Some of the weakness anticipated for this year is being pushed into 2024. And this one's from uh, a chief economist from Moody's. He said that the now strong chance that the U.S. economy will avoid a recession this year means the Fed will keep rates higher for longer to quell inflation, resulting in slower growth in 2024. So people aren't calling for no recession. They're just pushing it back. Do you agree or disagree? Well, it's interesting talking about Citibank. Uh, if you look at just the last couple of days, if you look at their credit hard, what we call hard retail credit, is was down 12 over 12 percent in august and that's after being down 9.3 percent in july and so it's interesting to me i don't know if they look at different sides of the picture or what but uh now you have to remember now a lot of wall street is going to be optimistic it paid to be optimistic if you if you're really a pessimist up there you won't be there long so you know they they get paid to be that way and i understand that from Moody's standpoint, uh, what I think they fail to realize is they're not noticing the trends of demand and looking underneath at some of the things that are going to be you're really coming out over the next three or four months. Right. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the uh, indicators for potentially a weakening economy. So the unemployment rate recently uh, ticked up to 3.8%. The latest jobs numbers came out last Friday. Uh, the U.S. economy added 170,000 jobs, which is lower than anticipated. And actually, they revised downwards the jobs numbers from earlier in the year. Perhaps the labor market is weaker than initially uh, anticipated. What do you think? Well, if you'll notice, David, a lot of the things that they've been coming out with, they've been revising downward after the fact. And I mean a lot more this year than I've seen normally, which tells me that they're almost afraid to put out negative news. And let's throw something out there and then we'll do a birth death run or something to make it look right. But if you look at what is really happening. I'm talking about if you look at retail sales, okay, you can see May, all the people have announced in here, Macy's and Target, everybody that's announced, Dick's, all those sort of things. They're they're just they're just one of many where you're starting to see the consumer get hit. And people keep talking about the consumer being in great shape, but we have a 22 and a quarter percent, you know, credit card rate right now. They've pushed up all their credit. Now you have credit card delinquencies higher over the last three months. You have 
you have car payment delinquencies higher over the last three months, and there's the money's running out. All the excess savings is is basically gone by the first of October, and then you have student loan things coming back in. A lot of things happening in this thing, and uh, I think I think they they want to be optimistic. They want it to go back like it was for that twelve year period. But I don't think we're going to be in that for a while. I have a question for the bulls out there, actually, and uh, maybe you can help me uh, address this. If the economy is really doing very well, why is a Russell 2000 not at all-time highs? Why is it just the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ led by the tech stocks? Do you think the Russell, the mid-cap stocks, are a better reflection of the economy? Or perhaps they're undervalued? Well, I do think this, that when the Russell is under pressure, and it obviously is done worse than the NASDAQ, but if you'll note, if you'll look closely back about the second, or maybe the second or third week in July, when all the big cap names, the high, they got their high for the year, basically right there. Now, don't get me wrong, there's one or two of them that have gone on. But generally, that whole group, that NASDAQ group, hit the high back then. I think that's a high. I think that's a high for the year for that group. And so if you're, you're going to see that and probably the Russell still continue to be under pressure, which will eventually, with these big seven stocks, bring the S&P under more pressure. And uh, But to answer your question, yeah, there's a lot of things would tell you that the economy is not you know, running. Number one, you know, if you look, we have a lot of debt that's going to roll over for those companies, for all of those companies this year and next year, particularly in the fourth quarter, first, second, third quarter next year. And those companies, from a refinance standpoint, are going to be under pressure. I've actually heard um, an argument for why higher rates may help companies. Maybe you can help clear up some confusion if there is any. Um, companies that hold treasuries on their on their books and their balance sheet are actually gaining from higher interest rates. Is that true? Well, it depends on what the business is. I mean, you could have treasuries on the balance sheet, but if your business is declining, it won't make any difference because that's where you make that's where you make the most money. It, it, you know, is in in that particular area. And I think people keep talking about, you know, sales, this and this being higher, that being higher. And one of the reasons it's higher is because they're paying more for the product. It's not that they're buying more of it. If you look at the numbers and it's up three or four percent for the year, that's because the prices went up. It's not because they're buying they're buying a whole lot more of something. Okay. Uh, but can you maybe provide a, a reason as to why demand may slow down? If you if you just look at the data, inflation has been coming down. Prices remain elevated, but they haven't you know they haven't declined. But it's not going up at the same rate of growth as maybe last year. Why is the consumer, the American consumer, still under pressure, Ted? Well, one of the reasons is that two big primary drivers, which are uh, energy, obviously oil at eighty five dollars. And real estate, real estate's a lagging indicator. So what happens is that the negative effects of that are just now starting to show up where you're starting to see some reduced rents on new things. But what happened is that that those two things hang in there to keep CPI really fairly high. And you have to get past those a little bit. And and, and that, that whole thing, by the way, drags down demand. I mean, um, you have to think, at least I think, that when you have August CPI come out, which is uh, next week, that you're going to see a higher number, uh, just because of nothing else, because of oil. It had a big move in August, and I suspect that that's going to go higher. And so we'll see if that happens. But I, I think people are missing the point. If you just look at general demand, go look at what's happening. People are buying less, and they're buying less of things that are interesting. They're buying less appliances, furniture, things that you think, well, housing is great, but it's really not. That's what I'm saying. They don't have the money. And so that's what those are things we watch closely. Is it possible, Ted, I'm just speculating here, is it possible that people may indeed have the money, they're just waiting for prices to come down? I mean, we saw that in Japan in the early 90s, and uh, people just kept saving and saving, and they caused deflation because of their savings. Well, I have to say, David, we don't think they have the money. I mean, you've got a number of something like 53% of the people in the United States can't even round up $1,000. So you're in a situation where I don't, and I don't think there's going to be any stimulus to help them because of where the federal government, they're in a hole right now too, 
if you look at uh, our deficits this year, they're exactly twice what they were for the whole year last year already. And so if you look at that and the interest they're having to pay, you know, there won't be any stimulus probably coming out of the out of Congress, I don't think, with a split Congress. But I'm just saying the people out there don't really have that much cash and they burn through what they had. I even see it's crazy, but I see people doing, you know, home equity loans, you know, at nine and a half percent. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, the reason is they need the cash. And that's really all you can say. President Joe Biden actually last week made a made a speech about the economy. He said that um, just this morning we learned that the economy created 190,000 jobs last month. All told, we've added 13.5 million jobs since I took office, around 800,000 of them manufacturing jobs. We created more jobs in two years than any president ever created in a four year, single four year term. What is he not reporting? Well, one of the things is most of these people in Washington, it's been a long, long time and maybe never that they've had to worry about, uh, you know, paying the electric bill or a home or a, or, a, or a home payment or something like that. So anything that they say about what's really happening in the economy, I don't have much. I don't even really I don't I don't put any faith in it. So, uh, I mean, I think he has to say that because they want they've got an election year coming up and they're going to try to put a big good face on it. They all do. You were talking about corporate bankruptcies with me four months ago. They've actually risen since then. So this is from S&P Global Intelligence. And I'll just read you a paragraph from their latest report. In July, filings rallied uh, to new highs. U.S. corporate bankruptcies rose again in July as high interest rates and a challenging operating environment continued to push U.S. companies over the brink. S&P Global Market Intelligence recorded 64 corporate bankruptcy filings in July, the largest monthly total since March, and more filings than any single month in 2021 or 2022. Filings in the first seven months of 2023 surpassed total filings for the previous year and were nearly on par with 2021's full year tally. Uh, is this what, what do you think is causing this? We talked about interest rates. Is there another reason for why uh, bankruptcies are happening on this scale, Ted? You know, uh, David, I think you had so many companies during that 2021 20, period that were able to go into business with no revenues, certainly no earnings of any kind. And since money was all over the place, they gave these people money to keep them alive, thinking that, hey, something great's going to happen in two or three years when it's really just pie in the sky and nothing's going to happen. Um, they're finally coming home to see, hey, uh, you know, a bank or even mezzanine financing, they're not going to loan them anything because they're saying, hey, you don't have you don't have a company here. You don't have you don't have any revenues and you certainly don't have any bottom line. And so that's all coming around. There's a lot of those companies, too. And it's not the first time I've seen this. We had that similar thing happen back in 95 to 1998 or 99. Well, I think we had something like 850 companies come public. And I'm, I'm just guessing that 400, half of them got wasted before it was all over by 03 or 04. Uh, you mentioned Oil, actually, let's touch on that very quickly. Do you do you have any insights as to why oil has been going up? You know, I think people are hung up on demand, but you can have lower demand. But if you've also got lower supply, then you still have a firm price. And I, and one of the things that's happened is you know they they they, they blew the market out with strategic reserve uh, oil that came out. Should have never happened. But when they did it. That created extra supply. Well, that went away, though, see, and that's gone now. And then you have certain parts. You have Japan. A lot of the forest countries are perking up. I mean, their businesses are doing better. And so they'll use more of it for sure. But um, it's interesting. I, 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 mean, I ran a graph off of this. I remember this. 1977, the, the market went down all year long in 1977, bottomed in March of 78. That whole year, oil went up. And people, if you looked at that, you'd think, well, that can't happen. But oil, it's, it can get off on its own. And you have to just uh, you have to watch closely what's happening. We know we don't have as much drilling as we had uh, a year ago either. So there's a lot of things factor into it. Uh, do you anticipate this trend to continue? Well, at least for now. I, you know, we own oil, not only the oil royalty and oil itself, but we own uh, the, the pipelines and that sort of thing. And so... Uh, 
I suspect it will continue for a while, sort of like a stag, sort of like we when we had stagflation back in the late 70s or early 80s, oil did really well. I mean, it was one of the few things that did well. It's interesting how you bring that up because oil spiked in 2007, right before 2008. So people are saying, you know, higher oil energy prices are an indicator of a rebounding economy. It's not always the case. So, um, yeah, 2007 was one example where it wasn't. The PCE, the core PCE index is something that the Fed uses as their preferred measure of inflation. The latest reading is still 4.2%, which is double their 2% target. Some people are saying that this is going to cause the Fed to keep rates for longer. And in fact, I read you a paragraph from a Moody's analyst who said that. What do you think? Do you think they'll cut before next year? I, I don't know what they'll do, David, but I do know this. Interest rates are cyclical. And anybody that tells you they're not has not been around a long time because I can take you through any economic period, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and interest rates go up and down. And I don't know when they do it, but eventually your rates come back down again. And it's usually when either you have a catastrophic loss, stock market, et cetera, or the economy really is tanking and they get scared and they think, you know, we need to do something. But um, the time timing of it's always hard. And I, I, we have a hard time with that because it's, you know, we don't, we don't know. So we just try to hedge, hedge the whole thing and hope we're, Hope we can come out on top on the other side, but I, but they eventually will come down. You know, I just don't know when, but eventually it will. We spoke four months ago when the ten-year yield was still much lower than it currently is. Uh, do you have any insights as to first of all why the ten-year spiked to a, a seventeen-year high uh, two weeks ago? It's it's trimmed off a little bit since then, but it's still relatively high compared to earlier in the year. Why why have yields been rising, Ted? Well, I I think when people People were thinking, you know, that that uh, you know things were going. We're sort of peaked out, you know, in that last hike, and they thought, well, uh, everything's going to be okay. And then, and then you go to Jackson Hole, and the chairman says, "Hey, look, uh, not true. <laughs> we're we're not in that mode right now." And then all of a sudden, you see some things. I'm talking about stagflation type things, where things are going up in price, but yet business is not good. And they're they they're thinking, well, gosh, I've got to have see if 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 you look at the spread usually between the inflation rate and a 10 year yield, normally it's going to be about um, one and a half points, maybe one and three quarters or so. And right. They had to make that a little wider because you're not getting inflation down to the point where you could say stick it at three and three quarters. And so I think people freaked a little on that and said, hey, well, you know, I'm going to sell some bonds. And that's what happened. But it's it's not an indicator of the uh, of people's optimism of either an economic recovery or strength in the equity markets. I don't think so because if you look at the uh, if you look at the you look at the earnings yield on the S and P five hundred and the earnings yield right now is less than than the Treasury yield, say in less than a one year Treasury. Well, as long as that's happening, there's no reason for you to. There's no reason for you to think that that's a setup for a fabulous market or something here. And I, I just think that's the situation you're into. And it's hard to convince people um, that if you're you're getting four and a quarter for a 10-year treasury, why wouldn't I buy a one-year treasury at 548? And so, you know, that that's where we are in the cycle right now. Well, I know you told me offline that one of your funds uh, does own quite a bit in in treasury, short-term treasuries. Can you tell us a little bit about that strategy and your thesis behind holding treasuries right now? Well, in this up uptrending interest rate environment, for us, rather than us trying to pick and choose and try to think that we know what the interest rates are going to do, which we don't, uh, we keep a lot of money in what we call a floating rate U.S. Treasury, which it resets every nine, every every Monday on whatever the 90-day rate is. And so, in it, in it, what I like about it is it beats all the money market funds, it beats all the Treasury funds because there's no management fee. So, you know, and, and I, I like that about it. And it, it, you can ride it all the way up. Now it's going to come back down too when rates come down. And so, that's where we have the most money. Now I might say to you. That we also have some money and some money in the one year, some money in the two year, and we have a little money, uh, you know, in the twenty-five and thirty year. 
uh, and just because we don't know, not it's the smallest part, by the way, but still we most of the money we we have right now is in the floating rate and it's paid off so far but we will have to make a move at some point because you know the rates will start down i remember before berkshire hathaway had bought apple shares uh a reporter asked warren buffett why he didn't get in and whether or not he has any regrets on missing the boat on the rally and he said something to the likes of, well, I don't really regret not being on a boat that I didn't feel confident enough to captain. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I think what he meant to say was he didn't know enough about the stock at the time to own it. And of course, after doing more due diligence, now we know that uh, Berkshire Hathaway does indeed own Apple. But I'll ask you the same question, Ted. Uh, do you have any regrets missing out on some of the gains for uh, some of the tech stocks that rally this year? Some of the uh, AI companies, for example, uh, NVIDIA. Well, let me let me say this about those, and I'll just tell you that you know we've owned Microsoft for 15 years, and so if you look at Microsoft, uh, Apple, and Google, we we still have positions in them. What we've done though over the years is as they hit new peaks, we would we would we sell those back. In other words, now they're down to, uh, I mean, Microsoft's still a fairly large position, but we sold that stuff all the way up, and when it comes to taking brand new positions. No, we have a brand new money coming in. We're not really pushing into those areas. We've made a lot of money in them over time, but they're smaller now. The places we see now that had, you know, more uh, more upside and, and certainly safety to us um, would would be in healthcare, energy. You know, uh, we bought we've done some things along that line. But I have to tell you that I think that this whole big seven or big ten stocks. They're, they're what everybody owns, and they own a lot of it. We don't own much of it. Uh, not saying we don't own any, but we don't own enough to hurt us. And so I think what's going to happen is these people that are concentrated in those areas, I think it comes back to haunt them because uh, when you have a market downturn, they go after the big ones. And, uh, you know, that's how always happens that way. And they go after them in the end, not in the beginning. They look okay in the beginning. And then as the end comes around, people are like everybody's in the same thing. So when they go to really, really sell, they sell the biggies. And I think that's what will happen this time. Is it an issue of valuations? If someone would ask you, why don't you buy NVIDIA now? Why aren't you jumping onto the whole AI craze or the next big trend in tech? Uh, what would your response be? Well, I can only tell you from experience. And uh, first of all, I've tried a couple of AI sites. And I have to tell you, I've gotten back some just flat out wrong information, okay? Of, of things that I already knew. I just asked a question and I have things I already knew. And then I'd see, you know, produce case law that didn't exist, all sorts of things. But it reminds me of that period three or four years before 2000. And all of these companies would come public in that three-year period. And all they had to do was put .com behind the name. That's it. That's all they had to do. They didn't have to make any money. Everybody was like, you know, this is going to be this word was the most talked about word I ever heard, new paradigm. And I had that told to me so many times. And it was, the internet changed, but it wasn't the way they thought it would. It, it was, we lost all of those companies or most of them. And the ones that survived are new companies that came along afterwards were the ones that really did well in the space. And I suspect that's what will happen with AI. I don't, I, I, I suspect that this idea that every company is going to be rejuvenated with AI is not true. I think they want to be on that bag and wagon right now, but um, that's because it's popular. So we'll just have to see. What was it about Microsoft and Google that attracted you or convinced you that they were good enough businesses to own? Well, first of all, uh, if you remember back then, the cloud was just starting when we, uh, we started buying those. Uh, and the cloud, we thought the cloud would transform things. We thought that was a, a business transformer, which it is. I mean, if you think about space and all the things you do as a business, it was a transformer. And Microsoft was the only company that went through the 2000 bust and changed their business lines. You know, they weren't the same company the 15 years after that. And so uh, you have to look and see what, what companies are going to be able to transform that I'll call AI into something you can really use in your business day to day. And I think we're not, I don't think we're to that point yet. Right now, I see we're at this point. You go on chat or bear any of them and you 
plug in questions and say, could you help me with so-and-so? And you get an answer, okay? Um, how that's going to transform operating companies, I think I'll just have to wait and see. Obviously, I'm a novice. People are going to say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. But I'm just telling you from experience that when you go through one of these fads like this, there's a lot of companies that are not going to participate in it. And the ones that do will probably do really, really well. I just don't know which ones those are right now. When you were to, when you were to look at a, um, a company to invest in, you were to evaluate the most important metrics in their financial statements. I'm talking about the three statements, your income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. Uh, what are the metrics you look at the most? I'll give you an example of something that some VCs that I've talked to don't look at, which is um, for some reason, the balance sheet. They don't really care whether or not the company has cash. In fact, they prefer that the company doesn't have cash as long as they continue to grow double digits in their top line. Um, they prefer if the net profit is actually minimal because it means that all the profits are being redistributed back to growth. Is that something that <laughs> you would uh, you would subscribe to in terms of an investment strategy? Like basically, what do you look at to evaluate if a company is worth investing in? Well, that's not what we do. Uh, I'm not saying what they do is wrong for them. I'm just saying what we do is we look at intrinsic value, which is basically how much cash flow present value I have on what I'm going to be having in the future. And I, I will say this, I don't care whether it's private business or public business, whatever, cash flow is king. And the way you get cash flow is by having more sales growth, selling more product, producing more profit, and that sort of thing. So I don't, I'm not on that same page with those people like that. And by the way, that worked really well during the free money stage. I do not think that will work as well during times when money's tighter. And I think that's what where we are right now. You have a new book that's coming out soon. It's called A Balanced Portfolio, The Price You Pay for a Peace of Mind. Uh, that's a very interesting byline. Why do we have to pay a price for a peace of mind, Ted? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you why, because if you have a big year in the market and let's just say the over the broad market's up, you know, 30 percent and you're only up overall, if you take all your investments, you're up 16 or 17 because you have a mix of things, you know, um, people will feel like um, they've been they've been slighted. But what happens is I find the biggest problem for anxiety for people is when they're not balanced. And I mean both directions, okay? They, that's, that's when they're too conservative, so we have no growth. And so you, all of a sudden you have this major uptick in the market for two or three years, and they have this unbelievable anxiety that I missed the whole thing, I can't kick in myself because I didn't buy anything. And on the other side, you have people that are so optimistic that they keep everything there. So you go the other way, and, it, and it's beating them up so badly, they have to come out of the market and they get beat up on that side. And I, when I say balance too, I'm including real estate and I'm including cash, I'm including private businesses. I just think if person will be, look at the whole spectrum and not just say, okay, I'm gonna do everything to try to beat the S&P 500. And you might for a couple of years, but then there's times when you won't. And so if your objective, and I think it should be, if your objective should be to keep your buying power up the rest of your life, and be able to meet all the things you want to do till you die. And that's, to me, the right way to invest. And that means probably you're going to hold some cash. It means you're going to hold some real estate. And uh, there'll be years when you won't do as well as, as everything else. But you have peace of mind because, you know what, when you go through a downturn, you won't get blown up either. This has been brought to my attention that in the history of the S&P 500, there have been more up years than down years. And so one argument is just go passive, buy the index, leave it alone, and don't worry about it. In 30 years, you'll most likely be up than down. Could you evaluate that strategy? <laughs> well, I, I think it's an okay strategy, but here, here's the problem you run into. And this happened to me when I early in the business from all the 70s and up through 83, 84, market didn't go anywhere. It just went up and down 20% for 15 years. Same thing happened between 2000 and 2012. If you just bought the index, by the time you got to 2012, you made 1% a year. People, they want to believe that's okay, and it works out over a long, long period. But when you start talking to people about, hey, don't worry about it, it's a 20-year deal or a 30-year deal, they blank out on you. That, that's not real to them. They want to know what, what's happening next month or next year. 
But I would say I would say this. That's one of the problems you get into. And, and the other problem is this. And I just saw this chart from J.P. Morgan, by the way. 20 years of investing, 2000 up through 21. I'm sorry, 20, 2002 through 21. And you got all these things that made money. Average investor makes 3.4%. The average investor came from Dalpar. Now, and so if you look at that, you'll realize that what people say and what they do are two different things. And so you try to invest for them so you can set them up so that they can go through these periods of extreme optimism or extreme pessimism and pretty much stay in the middle and be okay. You know, they'll do fine. But I, I think that's where people get off 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 target. They they go to a cocktail party and somebody says, Oh, I'm just making so much money, it's incredible. What are you making? <laughs> and then, you know, at that point in time. You know, they just can't, they can't say it. Of course, the same people won't tell you when they lose money. So I've been through all these things. I wonder what cocktail parties were like during the dog com bubble or 2008. Well, I will, uh, I'll tell you, I was at a few and, uh, well, I'm, I'm say I'm, I'm dinner parties. I should say I'm not big on the cocktails, not to never have one, but, um, but the main part was that you could always tell the person that was, buying all the high flying things because they really were making a lot of money. And they were the ones that said, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking about quitting my job. Uh, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm making so much money two hours a day that if I do this six hours a day, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to be retired. I'll retire in two years, three years, whatever. That's, that sort of thing came up a lot. And then, um, and then I noticed everybody started projecting into the future, what was going on in that three or four year period. But, by the time you got out seven or eight years, um, the same people that were talking like that weren't around, you know. And so uh, it comes and goes. You know, I always like to, I always like solid investors because that's the people I learn things from, and it's usually not at things like that. I, I actually know some people who have who have said those things to me, like, um, and I think they've done it. They they quit their job, they mortgage their home, and they trade it full time. I don't know how they're doing now, but this is back in twenty twenty one when the markets were up. Yeah, um, I I haven't followed up with them now. Um, maybe they've done well, maybe they haven't. What would you say that they should have done differently in order to survive the game for decades, kind of like you have? Well, one of the things I see, yeah, one of the things I see is this and that they end up um, they end up chasing the fads and if you look at right now for example you know one day options one week options that sort of thing that's not a long-term investing strategy and until you have enough pain in the market to where you clean that out you can't sober people up so to speak but when you do then they realize that you know I I, I cannot tell you David how many people have told me this um, in the last 25 years, they said, hey, oh, let me tell you, I got wiped out during the tech bubble. I'll never do that again. And I thought I was king of the road. You know, I was just blah, blah, blah. They killed going on. But that's just part of the cycle. And at times you have people all caught up in it. And I think that's where we are now. 4,500 points is where the S&P is at right now. It's been hovering around that range since basically mid-July, since after it's come down from its highs. What, are you looking for a catalyst for a major reversal? We know you think the economy isn't doing as well as maybe people are reporting, but the stock markets this year maybe haven't reflected that sentiment. What's going to what's gonna flip it? What would happen to really change things is that you keep having demand decline, which I think you will have. And that is um, when that happens and unemployment goes higher, the demand even goes lower. And then that, what happens from that is all of a sudden companies have to cut prices, margins go down, they're not making as much money, and obviously prices go down. I'm talking about public prices. So I think that's the catalyst, or that's basically the way it all comes out, and it's over a probably over the next two quarters, three quarters, that's what the way it's going to come out. And I, that, that to me would translate into a lower market and it would make sense to us. Is there a PE at which you're comfortable getting back into for the S&P 500? Well, you'd certainly like to be below 14 or 15, but I will tell you a lot of bear markets in at 10 or 11 or 12. And uh, that, that I know nobody's ready for that, but uh, you know, I don't ever try to judge what could happen because if people get into a mode where they're scared or they're worried about it, 
they'll oversell it typically. And I don't, I, I, I don't ever rule that out because they can certainly do it. Yeah. Well, uh, we're at 25 now, something like that. So that's 11 would be around a 50% decline. Um, all right. Well, where can we learn more from your work and follow uh, Oxbow Advisors? Well, the best place, David, is oxbowadvisors.com. Everything is on the website. You know, any of the books we've written, most of the things we do, you'll see quarterly letters on there, that type of thing. So uh, uh, be glad to have you uh, visit the site. Excellent. All right. Put the link down in the description below. Make sure to follow Oxbow Advisors there. Thank you very much, Ted, for your, for, for your time today. I appreciate your insights and wisdom as always. Appreciate it. Glad to be here, David. Thank you. And thank you for being here and thank you for watching the show. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe.